Hi folks, today I want to talk about a subject that is very dear to my heart, uh, which is phrasing. And what I'm going to do is take you through five or six tips for you to integrate into your personal practice routine to help you improve your phrasing. So when I was studying at the ATM years ago, I used to have a tutor called Michael Caswell, who sadly is no longer with us anymore, but he was a fabulous musician and person. Um, but Michael always used to talk about the three T's, touch, tone, and time. And for me, phrasing kind of sits in the middle of that triangle of the three T's. So what do I mean when I say phrasing? Well, much like the way that when you speak, you may have a particular accent, you may have kind of a specific words you gravitate towards in your vocabulary, there might be a certain rhythm to the way that you speak. Well, exactly the same thing goes for guitar playing. And these sort of tips are designed to help you refine your voice on the instrument. So with each of these, they're, they're little kind of challenges where I'm I'm kind of restricting like an element of your playing to make you think harder about the phrasing side of it. So you might find that initially you're having to think quite a lot about some of these, but that over time it will become more natural and they will help you to make better decisions when phrasing and improvising. Without further ado, let's get into it. So exercise number one, Rhythmic variations. So if we were playing over, let's say, a kind of C blues vamp, the focus of this exercise would be to limit yourself to only three or four notes. It can be any three or four that you want, but you are only allowed to use three or four notes in one position on the guitar. The reason for this is because it will force you to focus on getting as much mileage out of your rhythmic phrasing as you possibly can. So for example, if I am in C and I say that the notes I'm allowed are, uh, let's say, I'm give myself a root note as well. So I've got the flat seven, the six, the five, and the root. Well, your challenge would be to see how long you can go using just those four notes in that octave, in that one position before it starts to sound boring. And this would lead you to exploring different placement within the beat, exploring different subdivisions and how to actually get the most out of the notes that you have. So if I were just to sort of have a play with this without even having a backing track, um, I'm just going to kind of like keep time with my foot. Let's see kind of what we get. Okay. But you would keep that going for as long as you can, start to work through kind of different rhythmic subdivisions. So sometimes it might be focusing on chords notes, sometimes it might be focusing on triplets, um, bat, bat, um, bat, bat, um. sometimes it might be smaller subdivisions like quavers and semiquavers. Um, it also forces you to think about how you can play those notes. So sometimes it will be playing it as a regular note, sometimes we'll be bending up to it, bending up to it from a few notes below, or sliding into it, really makes you think about articulations. Number two is single string playing. Now this is something that Tim Pierce talks about a lot, and I want to talk about how to sort of visualise this on the fretboard. If we stay with the example of playing over a sort of C blues, we're therefore going to be thinking about a, a C minor pentatonic scale. The intervals for that and remember that intervals always relate back to the major scale are one, flat three, four, five, flat seven, five notes. But how does that look on one string? Well, from the root note, we have a tone and a half, which is three frets. We then have two tones. Tone is two frets on the guitar. So, tone and a half, tone, tone. Then another tone and a half, and then another tone. 
So we get tone and a half, tone, tone, tone and a half, tone takes us back to the root. And if you can do that on every string, it makes it a lot easier to, ooh, intonation, to visualize this um, when you're moving horizontally. Okay? Um, the idea with this is that it slows you down. Um, you can't play as fast if you're moving up and down one string as you can in position. So it makes you think more melodically and more rhythmically. Okay? Um, So looking back at the last two exercises, the benefits of it are kind of twofold because one, um, it gives you something very focused to look at within your practice routine. Um, to improve, we always want to try and make things sort of tough for ourselves and this will really get you thinking about it. But the other nice thing about it is that when you suddenly lift these restrictions, you'll notice that these things are feeding into your playing anyway. That even when you have access to more than just four notes, that you actually start phrasing more carefully and that you now have the confidence to see scales horizontally, which will break you out of like, you know, single position boxes. Number three is breathe. Um, and what I mean by this is think like a horn player. Now, guitar is one of these instruments where uh, we can just keep playing indefinitely uh, without ever kind of um, interjecting a moment rest in what we're doing. So if we look towards horn players, like a saxophonist, for example, um, phrases are dictated by when the player has to physically draw breath. And that can be a great thing to think about Music is conversational, and if you listen to even the way that I'm talking now, you'll notice that I'm interjecting pauses for emphasis, and that sometimes I'm going to be speaking more rapidly or for like a long duration of time. And you want to think about your guitar playing kind of in the same way. So think about where you would breathe naturally and use that as a sort of barometer for interjecting a little bit of space. And the kind of a point off the back of this is don't be afraid of space. Um, it can make what you're doing even more impactful. One, two, three. My fourth tip is restrict yourself. And now this is similar to the first exercise, apart from this one focuses more on intervals. Um, so if, for example, we are still in our sort of C blues vibe, um, I would think about what my scale choices are. And let's say it's um, Mixlydian. I would allow myself only a handful of notes. So I might say I'm only allowed to have uh, a flat seven, uh, the one and the uh, two and the three. And uh, what it will do is force you to lean on intervals that you might not normally lean on. You might be in a bit of a rut in terms of uh, recycling a lot of the same sort of phrasing um, just because your muscle memory might be kind of, you know, it tends to boss us around. Um, this makes you really think about what you're doing and it will kind of force you to explore some new sounds. Now, if you think that perhaps your fretboard knowledge is not quite there yet, make it simple for yourself. Let's say uh, we take the minor pentatonic scale, uh, but we're just gonna sort of like change one note. So let's say instead of having the flat seven, we change it for a flat, uh, a major six. So we get Kind of just pushes you out of your comfort zone a little bit. 
and uh, you know you can opt for like really weird intervals or you can just opt to focus on kind of like nice modal colors okay um, point number five um, imagination and singing so this is one that everyone usually gets a little bit shy about but it's, it's a really good one to ha have a play with um, and it's about trying to strengthen the connection between here and here and what I'd recommend doing is um, start with like a, a very very simple phrase and then try and sing it back and then you try it the other way around um, so you start to um, sing what you play and then try playing what you've sung so I'm going to try it, probably go quite wrong but we'll have a go um, so Okay, um, this isn't about my uh, dulcet tones. Um, it's about trying to sort of like strengthen that connection. And then, uh, you know, at the, the longer you do it, the braver you get. And then you can start to think about wider intervals. Um, and then you try and do it the other round. Uh, okay, uh, the aim is not to become George Benson. Well, that should always be the aim, to be honest, but, um, you know, it, it's not for the purpose of actually doing it live necessarily, the sort of thing where you play what you're saying or you scat or whatever. It's more about, um, you know, strengthening your uh, melodic sensibilities. So uh, number six is transcription and making phrases your own. So even the best improvisers on the planet will still only be kind of truly improvising a certain percentage of the time and that percentage is going to be uh, vastly more than probably the rest of us. Um, but nevertheless, there's going to be a certain degree of recycling, reusing, reimagining um, existing vocabulary. Um, and this is why transcription is so important to learn phrases from the players that you love and then try plugging it into lots of different contexts. So not just leaving it as a lick, but try playing it in lots of different keys. Try playing it in um, lots of different stylistic contexts or over um, different time signatures or different tempos. And that's how it will really become integrated into your vocabulary. The second thing you can do is try to sort of um, bookend it with two of your own things. Um, so you might have uh, a lick from one of your favorite players in the middle, but start and end it with your own thing. So an example of this for me would be uh, this kind of Sean Tubbs idea, which I nicked ages ago, and I actually can't remember if this is the lick anymore um, or whether I've messed it up, but it was along the lines of... Um, <laughs> might not be that. If it's not, I'm sorry, Sean. Um, but I kind of plugged that into my own thing to make it a bit more outside, a bit more wacky, and kind of mixed it with a Steve Lukatherism. Um, to get this sort of thing. So the, the lick is still kind of in there, um, but it's been bookended by two different things. And that's really how you start to develop like your own voice in there while still taking what you love of your influences. Okay, so just for a quick recap, um, number one, rhythmic variations. Restrict yourself to three, maybe four notes, and really focus on rhythmic placement, uh, different subdivisions, and how you can draw the most interest out of every note that you play. Uh, step two, single string playing. This will really help you with your fretboard knowledge, but also it will make you phrase very differently, make you phrase slower and more melodically. Number three, Breathe, remember, think like a horn player. Remember to allow rests and allow space in your playing. Number four, restrictive improvisation. Limit which intervals you allow yourself to use. This will force you into new colors and uh, will again get you really thinking about what you're doing on the fretboard. Number five is imagination and singing, trying to strengthen that connection between hands, ear and mind. Um, start simple, don't be self-conscious about it and um, you know just kind of build it up very very gradually and then you'll get to a point where it's much easier to articulate the ideas that you hear in your head. 
And then finally, transcribing other players, but then making sure that you make those phrases your own. Okay, that's it for today, folks. If you enjoyed this, um, if you're not already, please subscribe and leave me a comment to let me know what you thought of this, how you got on with it. Okay, but for now, have a great weekend and I will see you guys very soon. Bye-bye.